Today on the grid, it is open Q&A day, but, but we've got some ecliptical stuff for you because the Kuna man went on location to shoot the eclipse. We're going to be looking at some shots from there, but we are going to be taking your questions and providing semi-accurate answers. <laughs> and that is all coming up. Of course, the Kuna man is here back, fresh back from his trip across the country. We've got some awesome, awesome giveaways today. More stuff than we should give away. And uh, I would predict, and I'm making this prediction early, that it is going to be a fun, fun day on the grid. And where does, not where, when, <laughs> when you might ask, how does all this start? How? <laughs> it all starts in just 23.2 seconds. Let's go. Grid is brought to you by Platypod, the tripod alternative that is changing the world. Everybody has a Platypod. You should too. Go to platypod.com. Hey, everybody. Whoa. Whoa. Dobson's on Dobson's the gym. on the gym oh, today. <laughs> well, Dobson's back anyway. <laughs> that was a signature gym wow. move. That was a Dobson gym move. We need move. to have Dobson sign that gym move. Oh, yeah. Whew. Anyway, Ooh. welcome everybody. <laughs> welcome to the grid. It's live. It's Wednesday. Must be one o'clock ish. Um, we're glad to have you here. I do want to tell you up front. I'm kind of grumpy today. Uh oh. I, I know it doesn't seem like it at this moment. But so don't ask any questions. They're going to take complex answers. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. I'm just. I don't know. I think I'm tired or something. You know, I had. It might I, be the eclipse fatigue that's going around. It might be eclipse fatigue. I had to get up very early to take my daughter to school. I don't it know. It could be that too. I don't know. I'm just. I'm kind of grumpy. My wife noticed it this morning. She said, "You're kind of. I'm kind of grumpy." So I just want to warn. I'm. I'm just glad today is a blind critique day. Oh, okay. It's not good if I'm grumpy on blind critique day. Well, do but, we want to critique the jib moves all day? I think they're being critiqued by the audience already. <laughs> wow. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, um, today we're doing open Q&A. So we're taking yep. your questions on about anything, post-processing, photography, mm -hmm. lighting. But um, in just a moment, we're going to look at some shots. Mr. Kuna took the RV and I headed did. upstate and wound up in Missouri. I did. I walk up, wound up in Jackson, Missouri. All right. Yeah. He really wanted to be right at the heart of it. And he, he hooked up with some Kelby One members. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that it sounds like a really great time. And It was. Uh, it was an awesome time, especially to get to shoot with our member. You oh, know, yeah. Like, oh, no. And, that's, uh, that was cool. Yeah, because I got to shoot John, who's in our um, – he's one of our community leaders. And then Diane, uh, yeah. which you know as well. Oh, no, so, Diane's great. Um, it was really – it was really an uh, an amazing experience, but we'll go over that. And later. we're going to look at some yeah. uh, some images here in just a minute. Uh, let's see. We what have else some we announcements, right? We yeah. Got uh, next week, we got a big thing. Next week, we've got the Lightroom Conference. Lightroom if you conference. haven't signed up, it's not too late. Everybody's already signed up, so don't be the one person that goes, "Oh man, I should have gone to that." Uh, one of the best things about it is it is a two day, two track conference. So there's twenty something classes, but you get them archived for an entire year to stream on demand. So if you missed a class or want to rewatch a class or go back and touch up on something, it's all there. And uh, and you know another thing, Scott, is on the day before there's a pre-conference session yes, that there is included is. in your um, admission. Yes, there and is. it's all for beginners on that first day. So yep. if you're somebody who's like, I know a little bit about Lightroom, but I'm not like I haven't dived in that deep. That's a great primer. So you can watch that pre-con class and then the whole nest the next two days, you'll be set up to, for success. Okay. Can I promo my class? Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. I'm doing a class called Lightroom for travel photographers. Mm -hmm. And I put together some awesome stuff for this class. I cannot wait to show you because I'm, I'm actually going to start with, um, my backup strategy and my, uh, how I organize on the road, but it's just five minutes. I think I took literally or going to take about five minutes is what I have planned. <laughs> and then it's just tip a palooza. I've got all these nice. great Lightroom post-processing tips and effects and just things that'll make your little travel photos look better. So well, if that's that, if, coming if you're next pro, week. If you're promoing one, can I promo one? Please do. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to do in a class on using Lightroom exclusively to edit uh, night photos, like Milky Way and night photos. Ooh. I've got to the point where I don't even leave 
Lightroom and go to Photoshop anymore because Lightroom is so good what? anymore. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. It is absolutely crazy. All right. Yep. So that's coming up next. Yep. We go to Kelby1Live.com. We would love to see you sign up and join us because everybody has already signed up. It's going to be huge. We, we, we're going to have well over 1,000 people. So make sure that you're one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah, all definitely. right. And when I say people, I mean a thousand photographers, not just random yes. people. It's, it's all photographers. Okay. Uh, Joe McNally's got his workshop coming up here shortly in Ellis Island. He's got special access to areas they don't let anybody else into. So you can go catch that uh, at fancygirl, <laughs> fancygirlstreetboy.com slash Ellis I think we need to make a, Island dash info. We need to make a bit, bit of a link for that one. Yeah, but you can also go, you can find it on my blog. You can find it on Google it. .com. You can Google it. Joe McNally, Ellis Island. That's a better way to find it. It's coming up May 3rd. Uh, and he's going to do one later in the year. But it's only open to 75 people. So it's a small group of people. And, uh, and you get a box lunch. So really, just go for the box lunch. I'm sure Joe's mm -hmm. fine, but really, the box lunch is going to be outstanding. Yes. Uh, what else we got going on? Uh, I've got a workshop coming up next year in Antarctica. My first time there, but I'm going with this giant group of pros. See all those pros? Oh, yeah. Look at that. It's I'm joining list. that entire group of pros. They have a, an amazing ship. And if it, it, that's a bucket list thing. That is absolutely one of those once-in-a-lifetime trips, though I know a lot of people go, and then they go again and again and again. I'm sure Jason on our crew is wondering if you're wanting to film a class. Jason is not going to be. <laughs> I do not expect to see Jason in our. I expect to see him here in the control room while oh, I go. am enjoying the penguins. Anyway, uh, I did put a, a, a video of it on my blog. Or if you go to that page, you can watch. There's a little video on it. Man, you watch that video yeah. and you're like, I got to. Well, there's the video. Right go. There. And you watch that video and it has this like inspire. Look at this. And they've got those Zodiac boats so you can leave the big boat. And, you know, and yeah, go out right and, up on and there. just, wow, I know, just incredible. And, uh, you know, I never really had a big interest in the Ant Antarctic until um, Winston Hendrickson, oh, God yeah. rest his soul, yeah. uh, came back from his trip and I saw his I pictures. I remember that, and was, that was like was, 10 years ago, but yeah. And I, I totally, was like, that's it, now I want to go. I was it, the it, same. it went right on my list. So that's going to be a great experience and uh, it's my first time down there and I would love to see you join. If, you're, if you do wind up going, Please let me know because you sign up at munchworkshops.com. Mm -hmm. So I won't know if you sign up. Let me know. Say, hey, Scott, I'm coming with you. All right. That's pretty much it. Yeah, That's we got, all a, I got We got a bunch of giveaways, though. Oh, yes. We got a bunch of giveaways because we love to give away too many things. Let's see what so they are. I can't see what, are what they are. What are we giving away? What are we giving away? I can see Gary saying hello from a non cloudy buffalo, except during the eclipse, but the experience was awesome. Yeah, I would definitely, the, the clouds did hurt uh, certain areas, that's for sure. And then uh, Daryl saying hello for Fisher, Tex Texas, in the path of totality, but cloud cover, yeah. It's still an incredible experience. I did notice that uh, a lot of areas did have it break through the clouds for moments, so yep. that was great. Uh, Graham saying hi from all the way from Malta. David F saying hi from a sunny um, South Carolina, I believe. And then uh, Art saying um, hi from Bonita Beach. Antonio saying hi from Madrid. Hold Diane. on, Antonio. Madrid, Spain. Yeah, my mother. My mother was born yep. in Madrid. My mother was born and raised in Madrid. There you go. So, and then hold uh, on, Antonio. Diane saying hi from a stormy Pensacola. Uh, Jim saying hi from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Claudia saying hi from Toronto. John saying hi to the whole crew here watching from Washington D.C. today. So Joe I think they're back. Dukes. And then uh, Gail saying hello from the Finger Lakes. Ooh, those are nice. Uh, and then. Prizes though, we're giving away lots of stuff. A platypod elbow, so we got one of those. Um, great device for not, yeah. That there you go, platypod elbow. There it is. Great device to kind of like put your camera in any position you want. Uh, you can see down there in the picture below. Yeah, you can kind of like move it around. You can even clamp stuff to it if you get the clamp. Put your put a monitor, clamp put a microphone, put a phone, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then we're giving away a copy of Scott's How Do I Do That in Photoshop book. You can get that over on Amazon.com. <laughs> they love it when you do that. They right. love it when you do that. And then also we're giving away a copy of his Photoshop for Digital Photographers. So I'll bring it back to the focal plane. Yes. Right. The focal plane. And then uh, we're giving a copy of On One No Noise 2024, a new plugin. Well, 
It's an update to a plugin for removing noise and adding sharpening to your photos. It is amazing. <laughs> and we're giving away a V flat from V flat world. Now this is for US shipping only, uh, but everybody can win. All they got to do is use the code Kelby 10 at checkout and they'll get 10% off. Uh, Retouch for me is giving away their Mattifier app. Uh, you can also get 20% off over there using the code Kelby120. And then SlickPick is giving away a complimentary one year classic gallery plan uh, for new customers only. So somebody's going to win that as well. So all you got to do to enter is leave us a comment. It helps to tell us what you'd like to win. Um, but also, because this is open QA, ask your questions and you're automatically entered into the contest uh just make sure the question isn't too hard or you might get a little harsh answer answer from scott we're, yeah we're yeah, not sure yet I'm grumpy i don't know I'm grumpy. yeah so that's that all right uh so mr kuna yes you went so i went yes i uh like we were talking about on last week's show weather was a big big ordeal big ordeal so uh, i purposely did not make any plans beforehand like uh that's what I tend to do with these events when, I, when i'm going to clips uh any kind of weather event like that i i'm really zoning into certain areas about a week out so about a week out the forecast told me i was either going up to maine, maine. <laughs> or i was going in that missouri indiana uh illinois that kind of area um and then as we got closer those spots kept on kind of holding consistent to the forecast, but decided um, just with the, the complexity of the flights and getting up north uh, that it was a better option to go to Missouri. So ended up uh, getting over there and going to Missouri. Luckily, on the path of totality, uh, one of our community members was gracious enough to invite me up to his property. That was uh, nice. So uh, one of our community leaders, John, um, uh, he invited me up. Uh, we were able to see that and then then come all the way back. Uh, it was a long drive, a lot of traffic, so it was very interesting, but well worth it. It's amazing what you can see. Uh, here's some images so you know so so we can look at them. Um, so this is uh, I kind of I took a different approach with some of these images where I didn't go scientific. I did kind of like more of uh, different things. These are all, I, and I just have to warn you, I haven't had a chance and time to really do much compositing. You just got back last night. Yes. And well, and I just, I, I, I got these photos done and all these photos done in about 45 minutes afterwards and i just haven't had a chance to go back and do my compositing or my sequencing of different images so these are all single exposure shots that you're going to see here so that's the eclipse as it's happening you can see there's the moon going in front of the sun i kind of overexpose this one to kind of give it a different look almost like a apocalypse now uh, that's a traditional kind of eclipse photo where you're just getting like a little bit of the, yeah, the band this is right before we're, in, we're going into that totality. It's just getting to that point. And then we start getting kind of that magic happening. So here uh, I was able to pick up a lot of solar flares. So you can see those right uh, on the right of it, those uh, like um, red looking things that are coming out, solar fa flares. And then you get something like that where you're getting the uh, ba Bailey's beads. You're getting the beads coming through and kind of glowing uh, where it's hitting the uh, moon. This is a wider shot. Uh, what's interesting about this one is you can actually see down below in the corner, that's, that's Venus. So it's so dark now that you can actually see planets and stars uh, as it moves into totality. And that's another one. Uh, there's another shot of Venus and the eclipse. So there's the moon, the sun, and Venus all in that shot during the day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then that's an exposure to show like that's a proper exposure of how dark it was. And then these shots, it's just, it's very similar. And then the, uh, the sun starts moving and then it comes out the other side. So you're getting the beads as, you, as it exits the other side. Nice. Um, there's a kind of a closer where I've got closer cam. I got a closer camera getting, uh, the solar flares. And again, the solar flares that were coming. That was very interesting. And then this one I really overexposed to get the earth is reflecting the light back at the moon. 
so it's the earth shine so it's actually ah. the earth lighting up the moon i have this one i have to composite i haven't got around to compositing because i have a better shot of the moon that that i just haven't had a chance to uh composite in yet so there you go and then there's some of the beads coming out a little underexposure, and then the streak and then this is our group this is our group we're out shooting yep. so that's where we're shooting drone so Yes, that's drone. So that's John's uh, drone uh, taking a picture. Uh, went up with my brother-in-law. So my brother-in-law, you can see behind me. And then Diana and her husband uh, standing there. We're all just having a, we had a blast. It was a, it was an amazing experience. If, I mean, if you've never gone to one, never seen one, especially the total eclipses, it was very interesting because when we took this photo, it was about 75, 76 degrees. And just... 45 minutes later, when it hit that totality, it was down to 65 degrees. Wow. Just from that drop in temperature. And, and it's, it's, it's eerie because it gets all dark. Birds start chirping. Bugs, crickets start coming out. Everything starts, you know, just coming alive. Um, totally different. But Scott, Scott, I know, you, I think you shot the eclipse, right? I got one shot. It's, yeah. it's not that great. I got this one. Can you see my computer? I just got this one shot. Yeah, I got this. Uh, let me tell you how I got this. Yes, yes, I went to Adobe Stock and I typed in <laughs> Eclipse. <laughs> yeah, I did. That's not my shot. That's that's a stock shot. Eric saw me pulling it up. He saw what was going on. I'm sitting here yeah, on yeah. Adobe Stock. Oh, I knew. I knew you got eclipse. a. I got an Eclipse shot. That got was you for nice. a second though. There. Yeah, didn't yeah. It? That was a great one. That's a great one. All right. Looks hey, like Eric, it was made in a, Photoshop. Post there is eclipse a post question. Eclipse, yeah. eclipse, eclipse question. I don't know who it's from. It's just. Yeah. Uh, but it says, uh, was it better to get I shutter speeds? It might speeds? be from Jason. <laughs> oh, it, it could no, be. I'm just what, was it better to get shutter speeds at 1 500th with ISO 2500 or, or up to 5000? Or is it better to use a lower ISO and slower shutter speeds? So basically, is it better to get higher shutter speed and a higher ISO or lower shutter speed and lower ISO? I was using Daystar Solar Film that uh, you, Mr. Cuda, yeah, yeah. recommended. And I finally had to make it really dark versus ND feeder filters. Maybe it was, it was due to clouds that happened that day. Clouds would, would definitely do that where they're going to cut down the transmission. Uh, that definitely happens. But when the, the Daystar filter should, like we talked about last week, should be on only when the sun is uh, appearing. So if you could see my screen... This one right here has the Daystar filter on it. This one and this one. Every other shot I showed does not have a filter on it. So what's on them? Uh, nothing. Nothing? Nothing. No filter on all these. No filter. Nothing? No, that's just what is there. That is no filter. That is, that is my camera. And, and here's the other thing. All those shots I did this time because I've done tracking cameras on it. I went lo-fi because everybody says, oh, you only get those shots because this, that. This... These shots are with an R6 and a uh, $1,800 uh, telephoto lens, right? There's no magic filters, anything. Like, so that no, is a no camera. No worries about damaging your sensor? Not when, when it's at this stage, no. When it's at this stage, no, 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 no. Did you do no. a time lapse? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't got it done. <laughs> oh, but man. here I got to have the filter on because that's what people don't understand is if you're at a place where there's 99.8% eclipse versus yeah. hundred, yeah. you can't take your filter off. Like it's still so much light that's coming out from that. Just that 0.2% like here where it's just like a little bit you got, I had to have a filter on. So that's when you get down to it. I I'm wondering maybe if you left the filter on for those shots, but the, the question of, was it better to get a, a shutter speeds at at a, at one five hundredth or a slower shutter speed? I like a faster shutter speed when I'm shooting telephoto because the sun and the moon are moving, right? Yeah. So you can't go. I don't go much above well, one fifth of a second, uh, even for that um, Earthshine photo here. In fact, uh, you can see to get that one, I was only at one two fiftieth, but I I cranked up my uh, ISO, so I had my ah. ISO really cranked to do that because everything's moving everything's changing like uh you don't want and even here you know um you know that one i actually was a little so you know one one twenty fifth of a second one eighth of a second that and that's when i was telling you i traditionally wouldn't do that but i tried to experiment with different things yeah all but right. all uh, to answer your question there it usually is better to crank your iso and go a little faster 
but at the same time, you want different effects. So sometimes you lower your ISO, or ISO and raise your shutter speed. I like to vary stuff. I also like to bracket when I'm doing this. I talked about that last week. Because if you bracket, you kind of get different looks. Yeah, here's like another Zell. question. I, I hope, I'm, I'm probably not pronouncing this right. Irene, yeah. Irene um, Garneau asks, do you underexpose when you're shooting the Eclipse? I, I bracket because I like to see what, I like the overexposure sometimes, and I like the underexposure sometimes. Bracketing is good. Um, and that's why I like to bracket. Uh, but I tend to, for the compositing and stuff, underexpose. And you were not using a tracker, is that correct? Josh is asking. None of those shots were with the tracker. I usually would, but I decided, now I did do something with a time lapse of the tracker that I haven't got through yet. Okay. Which, the, the concept of a tracker, so we understand, it's, it's, it's tracking with the sun, so you never have to like recompose, but then it's tracking at the same speed, so if you keep your exposure open a little longer, you can get more detail. Ah. The only problem is, you have to polar align the tracker. Well, how do you polar align? I have no idea. You have to point the, the actual middle of it right at Polaris. Well, you can't see stars in the middle of the day, so I had to like take out my uh, compass, get it on, take out my, um, and do the altitude on my uh, little, little um, tracker, and do all that nerdy stuff, yeah. Lisa wants but to know, uh, do, will you end up uh, processing them in a way to reveal the stars, which I heard became visible on the on-air broadcast, so many were mesmerized by the fact that they could see stars. Yes, yes. I, I didn't get any too, too wide. I, I, my wide camera, I haven't got to yet. Uh, but this one, like you can see, like there's Venus. Uh, the, there's there's uh, the moon and then there's Venus right down there. So yes, you can definitely get it. Where we were, we could definitely see stars in the direction of the sun, not as much, but when I looked around, because I did take, even though it was a four minute, I did take 30 seconds and just absorb this and not take any shots during that time. You know, like kind of in the middle. I, I had a time lapse going, so I- so, so that planet that you're showing on screen right there, what was her name? Venus, I'm your Venus. No, your, the answer was Venus was her name. Venus so that's, was her uh, name. I'm sorry that uh, yeah. we're deducting 500 points. There you go. We are going to take a short break. Now, we're not taking just questions about the eclipse. Yeah, like any that. questions. There were some good questions there. Yeah. So if you have any questions of, of any kind based on anything, or the question could be, where did you find Dobson? And why is he allowed to run the jib? <laughs> <laughs> Butter. Butter. We're gonna, all of that is coming up in just a moment. Smooth. That, oh, yeah, that was smooth. Smooth. Okay, landscape photographers, wildlife photographers, all you guys, travel photographers. I've had so many of you come up to me and go, you know what, I stink at taking portraits. I'm not any good at them. I've never taken a good portrait. I'm not a portrait guy. Just not me, I'm not a portrait gal. Nope, not me. You know what? You're probably not until you watch this course. I'm gonna set you up for success. We're gonna stack the deck and all of a sudden, the clouds are gonna part. You're gonna take your first portrait following everything I say in this class. You're gonna look in the back of your camera and you're gonna go, holy cow, I can do this. You're gonna become a portrait photographer when you do this because you're gonna fall in love with the whole process because it's easy and simple. There's steps that people are leaving out and I'm putting them in. You're gonna get all of them in my brand new course. It's called taking your first portrait and knocking it out of the park. And it's exclusively here at Kelby One.
This segment of The Grid is brought to you by Canon. Hey, we're back, Rumpy Scott, with uh, Mr. Kuna. Let's hold that jib shot. Let's hold that jib shot. Oh, that's better. This is yeah, better. Yeah. This is looking Dawson good. Dawson said on the break. This look good. But he said, I practiced that one before, and, I, and then I'm this like, was, that, that this, was, is, this is better. That's almost it's one. Smooth. That that's, was, that was very nice. That's almost one. Yeah, that's wow. good. Wow. Wow. You can stop. Oh, yeah, it's getting a little rough there at the end. There we go. (laughs) Yeah. Jason had to switch off yet. Wow. All right. Lots lots of questions here. A whole bunch of questions. And we're still basically on the the eclipse. So the first one's, uh, oh, uh, we answered that that one. one. Uh, Chase wants to know, uh, what is the best Best way way to focus on the sun? I was struggling using. Well, can I say this? Let me just say this before we answer Chase's question. You got plenty of time to get ready for the next one, Chase. Lots. Well, there's one in 2026 and one in 2027. Like I said, there's not like next weekend yeah. we're doing this again. But Chase is asking. Well, no, but this is, is his question. No, no. Yeah. No, I'm just, I was making it's a, a joke. No, it's a good. Joke. Eric. It's good. Eric. It's good. Eric. Yeah. Shut up. All right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know you're grumpy. I know. I know. I, was I know. Doing, I was waiting for an opportunity to do that. I'm, I guess I'm not as grumpy as I thought. Jay, <laughs> Eric, shut up. <laughs> Jay says, what is the best way to focus on the sun? I was struggling using manual focus and everything is blurry. Yeah. Um, Dang so sun. I will say that like, yeah, it's very, it's very hard. Obviously, if you had a filter on, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you the way I do it. Uh, no, no. The way I do it is the same way I do it for Milky Way. Um, so if peak, yes. So we're, we're, we're going to go and actually use our magnifying in live view. So that's what I always with the Milky Way, always with astronomical stuff, you um, put it in your live view. Uh, again, if you had a, uh, you should have had a filter or something blocking it. So it would have been dark. You would have seen those edges. Uh, you zoom into like that 10%. It's going to get in really tight. And then you're going to just micro and it will be these with those stars and with the sun, which is a star, it's going to be like little, little micrometers. And then you'll see that edge go into focus. When that edge goes into focus, or with the star, when the star becomes as pinpoint as possible with the Milky Way, that's when you know you're in focus. You tape down the focus and you leave that's it alone. It. You don't touch it again. Don't touch it again. I mean, the it's so far away that even it moving through the sky isn't going to matter. Antonio's got a good question, and Antonio, as we know, is from Madrid. Mm-hmm. All right, he says he's total a total newbie to Milky Way here, but he has a couple of questions. Uh, oh, no, he, excuse me, he has a couple of locations that he selected out to take Milky Way photos, mm-hmm. but, and this is a big one. If he's but, in Spain, he's got some good spots. Yeah, Spain. Well, yeah. everything is good in Spain. Yeah. But uh, GC won't be available from the position that I want. Galactic Core. Galactic Core, for those of you. I'm glad you said that because I had no idea what GC was. Mm-hmm. I thought it was like GQ. Um, from the position I want the camera to be in is, is it still worth the time if I cannot see the Galactic Core what say you, Mr. K? You know, I will say I always prefer the galactic core, but the tails of the Milky Way still look very impressive. Uh, you just you just got to compose it, and you're you know obviously if you're scoping it out, you're probably using photo pills. It's going to show you in photo pills on the top bar like what the Milky Way is going to look like, so you can kind of get a good um, uh, position of it. The other thing is maybe when you're going, the galactic core is invisible but the it moves throughout the year so if you're in the summertime it's going to be better it's going to be above the horizon i think because if you're in spain there is a time during the summer and late spring early fall months where the galactic core should be up and should be visible so it might just be time of year because that's a big thing when you're starting out with the milky way is the time of year you shoot it totally varies all right uh jeffrey paul says i watched a lot of your business classes but i still struggle to price my digital mm-hmm. and my print photos and my time for photo shoots. Do you have any advice? There so Jeffrey, this is a very, very sticky topic mm-hmm. because you're not supposed to get a bunch of photographers together and say, here's what it costs. That's price fixing. So that, you know, we, we, it, th- this is why you're having a hard time doing this is because no one's going to say, Jeffrey, uh, the time for a, uh, the time is $75 an hour and your print should go for 200. No one's going to tell you that, that those are made up numbers. Don't use those numbers. Um, so if I were to give you any advice, what I would say is, is every market is different and 
and the type of pictures that you take are different than everybody else's. Mm. Um, I know that we just released a class this week on selling your images, this past week, on selling your images from Le Liesl did a class. Yeah. She sold over 600 images on Fine Art America. I saw she sold a big 40 inch print this last week. Um, and she goes into great detail on how to sell your prints. But finding what you charge for your, for, for your time in your, like when you do a photo shoot, it's completely different in New York than it is in Cleveland, than it is in California, than it is in Tampa. Every market is different. What I would say is, you know, usually market dictates the price of everything. If you price something too high, no one's going to buy your product. Yep. If you price it too low, a lot of people may buy it, and then you can raise your price if, if there's great demand, and you will find that sweet spot at which people will still buy it, and you're not losing sales, right? There, yeah. so it, it, the whole That's thing the of, best advice right the there. The whole yeah. thing of pricing is very, very sticky, and it is... Um, a case of you have to test it. You have to test it for your market, for your type of photos. Pick a price that you feel is lower than they're worth and see if it sells. And if they don't sell, either the photos aren't good <laughs> or, or, or the price is still too high. You've got to find out. It's, it's tough. And, and Jeffrey, everybody would love for somebody to tell you, here's what the price, here's what the going price is in our town. But there's so many variables how you present your online store, how you present your images, how you, do you come across as a top pro? Do you come across as somebody who's an amateur that's just trying to sell? I mean, it's just, there are so many variables. variables I, there's, yeah. The classes I would watch is I would go watch Liesl's class. Just came out last week. That's number one. Uh, I would also go, Tim Wallace did a class. I don't know if you've watched Tim's class, but it absolutely got rave reviews and Tim makes his whole living selling prints and doing photo shoots and do that stuff and and they uh, supposedly his class was the super pragmatic class for selling your images and and selling your own work go watch Tim Wallace's class on Kelby one and watch Liesl's class yeah and I think with with Tim's class what it is is uh those are kind of things that keeping an open mind to he might shoot something different but it's applicable to any style of photography. This is true. Like the business principles that he's yep, talking about are, right. are applicable. Yep. So if you watch it, you're going to be able to, but that's the best advice. Yeah, it was right there what you said. Michael's got a, a good question here. Yeah, so Michael's asking, I'm getting into shooting uh, my stepson, or my stepson sport, uh, sports, uh, hockey and lacrosse. I'm pretty good at hockey, hockey since it's indoors, but would love some tips about shooting lacrosse outdoors during the day in variable lighting conditions. Good news, Michael. Mm -hmm. Shooting outside is way, way, way easier, easier than it is shooting indoors. Indoors is a challenge. Outdoors is a no-brainer. You're going to have super high shutter speeds outdoors. Even on a, on a cloudy day, you'll be able to shoot at low ISOs and things. Just shoot wide open. Uh, shoot at whatever the lowest f-stop is that your uh, lens will allow. So 2.8 if you can get there, f4. Uh, even f 5.6 whatever you can get is your lowest f-stop leave it there all day long leave your your iso at 100 if it's a reasonably bright day but but michael the thing that you're looking for and you're looking for this inside as well as outside should be very easy outside is a shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second and that will freeze the motion you don't have to go any faster than that especially if it's kids sports and stuff but you know your stepson he, you know, he might be 16. He's playing lacrosse. He's probably not eight. <laughs> he's probably, yes. you know, so he's probably, they're probably moving pretty quick. Not at the speed of pros, not at the speed of college athletes, but you know, but uh, yeah, one one thousandth of a second. Uh, what you can do, Michael, is, and, and I talk about this in my shooting sports classes, if you want to watch one of those. I have a thing for beginner shooting sports and, and, and the setting that I tell everybody to use, and I was using it myself and still use it, is I turn on my auto ISO. Yep. And I set my minimum shutter speed to one one thousandth of a second. So regardless of how the variable uh, lighting conditions change, the lighting yeah. change, it doesn't matter. I'm always going to be at one one thousandth of a second. Michael, the thing you're most likely to come home with if you don't do these things is just out of focus photos. Photos where the players are not sharp and it's not mm -hmm. crisp and stuff. Use auto ISO, minimum shutter speed of one one thousandths. Shoot it wide open and uh, use a long lens. The longest lens you have, the better. 400 would be ideal. 
Um, and you can get a, you can get, you don't have to use a super expensive twelve thousand dollar lens for a day game. So you can get away with shooting at f five point six and stuff like that. Oh so. yeah, all day long f eight. You know, a lot of times too. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see what else we got. Can you scroll? We got what else we got? Uh, there we go. Gary's got a question. Yeah. So Gary's asking, what are your uh, strategies strategies for balancing a vacation with wife and four friends to the UK and France? With photographing amazing, photographing amazing landscapes and architectural architecture, without ending up in the dog house. Maybe? All right, Jerry, I got you. I, I think I just yeah, one well, the dog house. Okay, oh, I'm going to say Jerry, dog house. Here's the thing: what you're going to do is the thing that your four friends are not going to want to do. Yep, you're going to get up wake at up dawn. Early. That's you're going to get up really, really early, and you're going to sneak out, and you're not going to wake up anybody. Yep. You're going to wake up really, really early. The streets are going to be empty. There's not going to be tourists anywhere because tourists hate getting up early. And you're going to be able to go and shoot all of this stuff, the landscapes, the architecture, all that stuff, while they're all asleep. Now, you might be able to get them to go to a beautiful sunset shoot. Usually. Like, yeah, that's, usually. That's yeah. not going to be probably a, a problem. But if you really want to get the kind of shots that you want to get, you got to get up early, right? So, you know, Eric and I are doing that's a workshop the, in Santorini, and usually we leave the hotel around 4.45 a.m. in the morning to have time to get on location, get our gear out, get set up, and shoot a half an hour before sunrise. So that's, that's, that's it. You're just going to be getting up early every day. Or... Get into shooting the Milky Way, and then nobody's up at that. Hours and nobody either. cares about that either. <laughs> like, stay up very, very yeah, late. They don't care. All right, we got to take a short pause. We got some more questions to come to when we get back. Also, we're going to be giving away some prizes, and we're going to see if I can not be grumpy. Uh, what did you just say? I don't know. Shut up, Eric. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm kidding. Except for when I talk about Dobson. That's not you. Oh, dude, uh, our here heads we go. were cut off. It's okay. It's okay. It's getting better. Oh, so it's moving fast. Oh, oh now, going I downhill. Getting, now I am getting grumpy. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dave Clayton. I'd love you to join me here at Kelby One for my brand new class. And in this class, we are gonna cover so much. I'm gonna be showing you type tips. We're gonna be making brushes out of type. We're gonna be putting type round shapes. I'm gonna be showing you vintage effects. We're gonna be looking at different ways to take your images, select the subjects and put type in front behind, make movie posters. There's so much in this class that I know you're gonna absolutely love. So I'd love you to join me, watch my class, learn a whole bunch of tips about type and learn to love type as much as I do. And you can catch it here exclusively on kelbyone.com.
This segment of The Grid is brought to you by Platypod, the world's most compact tripod base. Hey, oh, we're back. Let's is. see. Anything cut off? Oh, close. It's looking good. No, that was pretty good. I think going down, he's, jib he's, critiques. he's getting... I think he's doing better. Yes. Next week on The Grid, jib critiques. We don't have a grid next week. No, we don't. No, next week is Lightroom a Lightroom conference. conference, so we will not be having a grid next week. But... but you know, but you know what we do have? I think we got something. Lightroom tip. Lightroom tip yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I'm going to actually show you a tip that is going to be in my light. You know, I mentioned my Lightroom travel photography one. And I said mm -hmm. I have all these tips. I got a bunch of them. So I'm going to share. What I'm mode did you shoot this picture in? Uh, that was aperture priority. Thank you yes. for asking. All right. Just, just checking. So thanks for asking. Okay. So uh, I love atmospheric effects. And if you've ever seen me show this picture of the dark hedges, uh, one thing I did was to en enhance the, uh, those effects. So the first thing that I would do, this is very easy to add a foggy effect here. What we're going to do, we're going to go to the masking tool. Okay. We are going to click on the radial gradient. That's a gradient that makes ra radials. Yeah, it's circles. Oh. Nope, it makes radials. All right, we're going to draw where you want the fog to be. Then, this is so ridiculously easy, you're going to kill me. We're going to go to the contrast and lower it to minus 100. And then we're going to scroll down to effects. And we're going to take the dehaze to 100. And here comes the fog. And there you go. And this, this would look great on like a lake, you know, or a pond. Or, I mean, there's a lot of places where fog looks good. And then you can, of course, make this as big as you want it. You can make it where you want it. You know, you can make it really low-lying fog. fog. It, yeah. You can make it low-lying. And you can also, you know. Now, if you want more fog, you're like, how do I get more fog? I'm already at 100 and 100. Go to the mask, right-click, and choose Duplicate Mask. Now, it's going to double it up. It's going to be yep. very, very foggy, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's super fog. yeah, but look, there's yeah, that's super fog. So watch, that's a lot of fog, right? But then, of course, you could go on the second one and lower the amount of dehaze and lower the amount. The contrast actually does a surprisingly big job here. See that? You could kind of dial in. That's some nice yeah. fog, it, right? It, yeah. There you go. There's some. I think it's a little high, to be honest with you. But anyway, yeah. no, I don't mean the amount. I mean like it's high up in the, in, in yeah. the in the frame. You could change the yeah. The you can move it. Well, you can that. move it. I would just drag it down some. I think it's just a little, little too high in both cases. Go to the second mask, bring it down. Yeah, I think it needs to be more like that. Like I don't know if that low lying fog would get that high. You know, I mean, I guess at some point it might. But anyway. Yes. Anyway, I'll show you the the before and after here, so you can you can see. So that's how we add an atmospheric effect. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your Lightroom tip of the day. There you go. All right. So Gary's asking a question. Hey, uh, Gary. For general everyday photography, do you think that having the camera set to auto ISO is a good alternative to using P mode? Well, here's the thing. They are two completely different things. Yeah. <laughs> they are wildly different. They're just completely different. So, Gary, if you've watched any of our classes, and I I'm, I'm, imagine that you have, you will notice that I don't think you will ever find a class on Kelby One from any photographer using P mode. Because P mode is just when you have to go to the restroom. But I thought P mode was professional mode. It is not. P mode is program mode, which means the camera makes all the decisions for you. You might as well shoot with your phone. So... Generally, I shoot in two modes. In fact, I only shoot in two modes, either aperture priority, which is what I would do all of my travel photography, landscape photography, things like that. Or I shoot in manual mode if I'm using a flash or a studio strobe. Those are my two modes. I only have to know two. Now, occasionally, Mr. Kuna has nudged me into using shutter, shutter priority, priority. That's my when, only other mode too. When shooting, only when shooting aviation. aviation. So yeah. or I, action or action action, action aviation I go to sh I go to I, shutter I only my only action is aviation so yeah but anyway Gary we got to get you off P mode 
We got to get you off. Yeah, and the I, auto ISO, like you were talking about before, that's what you don't have to worry about. Outdoor sports, auto ISO, minimum shutter speed, you're golden. Never yeah, have to worry. But auto ISO and P mode are like they're they're like two different things. It's kind of like saying in my car, should I use the air conditioner or should I use the electric seats? It's like well, those are two features in your car, but they're not related. They're they're kind of different. So yeah, um, it's hard though because they put it in that dial. Yes, on the top. I, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, but uh, yeah. well, auto ISO isn't on the dial on the top. No, it is not. P mode auto, is auto ISO is not. They yeah, that one. So yeah, th so Gary, but we got classes that'll take you through this. In fact, Gary, I have a class I want to pitch to you. May may I call you Gary? Oh, thank you. So Gary, I did this thing called the photographer's fast track. And uh, it is basically five classes, and you do mm -hmm. it in one week. So you go to Kelly, but there it is, the fast track. It's five classes, and you just do one hour a day. Now, Gary, to be honest with you, I say it's one hour. It's some of like an hour and 10 minutes or something, but it's around an hour, hour a day. All right, an hour-ish a day. And you do it for five days. And in the very first class, the very first one is the only class I talk about camera settings. Because I know that we want to get that out of the way early so we never have to talk about it again. And I go through why you want to use aperture priority mode for everyday photography, which is what you're asking about. And I go through and I talk about auto ISO and I talk about aperture priority. I talk about the all-important exposure compensation. But that's just in class number one. So you could say, I just want to watch class number one. Now, Gary, here's the thing. It is possible that you're not a Kelby One member. If so, here's what you could do. You can just go and join, watch that class, and we offer a 100% money back guarantee. So if you go watch that class and go, this class sucks, you can get your money back. You're not going to say that, though. And here's why I know that. Not because I taught it. Because I've read the comments on the Fast Track. Oh, the yeah. Fast Track so has many, been one of the biggest hits so we've ever done comments. in the history of our company. Those five classes... We, Eric and I worked it out to we're going to put together this curriculum that in five classes isn't going to move you up one level. It's going to move you two levels up like you're going to jump years ahead. I, and I mentioned this the other yep. week. A guy just wrote me a, a note said, Scott, I know that you made this for beginners and to get people up to speed fast. But I've been using photography. I've been a photographer for 10 years and I learned a ton from this. So if you want to you want to move ahead fast and get off P and get out of the restroom, then watch well, that first and that, class. And that first class really does. It, it simplifies like we talked about. You don't need to know everything on your camera. No. You need to know these few things because, honestly, like we only need, even as professionals, we only need a few modes and a few things, and we're yeah. good. It's very much like your car, right? Your yeah. car needs three things. It needs a brake pedal, it needs a gas pedal, and a steering wheel. That's what it needs to drive. But your car is packed full of other stuff that just make the experience yep. easier and more fun and more comfortable, but they don't change how the car yeah. drives. The, our cameras are very much like that. And, Gary, I talk about that exact topic during one of those. All so right. give it a watch so, and you'll see. So Rich is asking a question. Rich is asking, uh, Scott, how do you pare down your photos in Lightroom? I have seen your tips, uh, your tip before on how to narrow them down and can eliminate one by one until I get the best one, but I can't find it. I, I am going it. to find it. I'm going to show you. Let me just grab a, uh, a set of images that are like that. Hang on. Let me give me a sec. Don't move. Don't breathe. Don't make a sound. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go. Oh. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's say that you have a lot of images that are very similar like like these which are very similar uh let's i'm just gonna pick so what you would do all right rich is you go let's, let's just pick the ones that are similar so one two three four uh five six seven eight nine i want to find the best one of these uh what you're going to do is two things press shift tab to hide everything else so shift tab just hides all the panels yep then press the letter n as in nancy and it, you enter what's called survey mode, and that's the thing that you were looking for. And then, here's what you do. You move over, you're, you're not trying to find the best picture, you're trying to find what is the one I like the least. Well, I like, I like this one the least. You move your cursor over it, watch. Watch, I'm middle center. See how the little X shows up? I just say, okay, well, this is not my least favorite. It removes everything else, it makes mm -hmm. your images bigger, 
And now you're just going to go through here until you say, all right, what is my next least favorite? This one with this big chunk yeah, of rock, like that's that got to go, right? That's got to go. And then you go, all right, what is my next least favorite? This is kind of nothing. And then you just keep going and going until you get down. I'm not crazy about any of these photos. Yeah, yeah. There's not a winner here. But let's just say that there was. I would normally do this with like portraits and things like that, right? Yeah, and it'll get you down to a clear winner that way. Yeah. Hey, you know what, though? Can I? Uh, I just did a shoot the other day. Hang on yeah. with, with uh, Sarah. And let me let me show you because I had to do that with her. Well, maybe while you're finding that, we can yeah. answer a couple. So Peter's asking for birds in on in flight. Yeah, uh, for birds in flight is uh, is auto ISO good? Yes, absolutely. Any oh yes, action, it is great having an auto ISO. And then the the key there is that minimum shutter speed. If you know the minimum shutter speed you want to shoot the bird in flight. You can set that so your camera will never let you go below that shutter speed so everything's sharp. No matter if the clouds come, it gets darker, lighter, goes into a shadow, comes into a highlight, it's going to do all that adjustment. So now all we have to do is focus on framing and composition while and panning. Well, with that, you're panning, so you're just focused on panning. You're not focused on changing exposures. You're not focused on anything else. You're just letting the camera kind of do the work. Okay, here's a better, this is not from that shoot actually, but this is, this is a better idea of what I would do in survey mode, sorry. See how the photos are all pretty much similar and I'm yes, trying to find what's good, the good yeah. one. And then so this one where she's goofing, okay, that goes away. Uh, this one where I can't see her eyes, that one goes away. It's a lot easier when this one she's laughing, right? And then you're getting down to where this one, uh, she's kind of looking off. Uh, that one I'm not crazy about. Uh, that one... Uh, See, she's smirking here. It's really easy when, when you get down to it. I picked nine. I, I don't like any of these. <laughs> I, I picked nine bad yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. But, but to, the, to the point, you can see how right. similar images. Right. You start narrowing it down. And, and so, that's the whole thing. If you get to those yeah, nine and you're I, like, I so got to go to another nine. I would go to the next nine. Well, there, there's one of, the, one of the ones I like. I like that one there. You can see a couple different exposures of it. But that, that was the one that uh, I, right. I actually wound up retouching. Awesome. But, uh, yeah, you can go through here, and then you can find other ones that it was getting kind of dark. Anyway, you get the idea. I think that's in Oldsmar, Florida, isn't it? That is in Oldsmar, Florida. Oldsmar, Thank you for Florida. noticing that. We're going to take yes. a short one. When we come back, we've got a couple more questions and some comments that we got coming in. And then, uh, and then we're going to give away some prizes because we're losing yes. money. So stick around. We'll be right back. Everyone, I'm pro nature photographer Ian Plant, and I bet when you make wildlife photos, you're really excited. You're working with these beautiful subjects. But I have to ask you this. Do you sometimes get back home and look at your photos and you're just really disappointed? Even though you were photographing a beautiful subject, your resulting photographs just aren't capturing the true essence of your wildlife subject? Well, that happens to me all the time. The reason why it does is because you get too excited about the wildlife subject. What you need to do is take a step back and think about ways you can get creative with light, with composition, with your camera settings and other techniques to take your wildlife photos to the next level. So check out my class. It will change the way you think about wildlife photography and it will force you to start getting more creative about your visual design and the creative use of exposure and light. And that will allow you to make compelling artistic wildlife photos that get noticed.
portrait and a wedding photographer based in Valencia, Spain. I do mainly commercial and editorial photography and I retouch up to 100 photos a month. We shoot almost every day for all kinds of clients, such as commercial, beauty and fashion. And we retouch our work more often like every other day. I used to spend over one hour for one photo. If we want professional results, we must remove skin blemishes, do micro dodge and burn, highlight eyes, widen teeth, and even reduce wrinkles in clothes. And this can easily take me up to two hours of work for each photo. So when I saw that there's a plugin for Photoshop that helps you retouch quicker, I was eager to get my hands on it. I had many feedbacks about it and I found a lot of positive reviews, which made me to consider buying my first plugin. One of the challenges we have at the end of a session or wedding is to achieve an addition in our photograph that looked natural. This is where retouch for me has become a game changer. I love the feature that you can pick how much effect it has on your photo and you can adjust it accordingly to your style. I saved a lot of time and always end up having amazing results with my work. I am extremely happy with the quality. Now I am more efficient and have more time to spare with my family. This segment of The Grid is brought to you by B&H Photo, the professional source since 1973. And there it is. Nice. Look at that. Beautiful. Oh, man. I'm telling you, I, there's high hopes for, for Dodson right. here. So we got more questions coming in. We got a couple Jeff. more questions. So Jeff's asking, uh, air show this weekend? If going, Scott and Eric, uh, what days will you be going? So there's a right. couple air shows, right? Yeah, so Jeff, I'm flying out tomorrow on a very, very early flight to Dallas, Texas, to an air show at the Naval Base out there near Arlington, so in the area of... Uh, Westfield Village, I believe. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to go out there and shoot. Uh, there's, uh, We have access uh, to the military day. So on Friday is the, for the military base only, and then the public is on Saturday and Sunday. I'm flying home Friday night, so I'm going in tomorrow. We're going to shoot late tomorrow for a sunset shoot. Then, uh, And you know who I'm meeting out there? Kelly Jones. He was just on the... Just on the show Just a few on the grid, weeks ago, yeah. and I'm going to meet up with Kelly. We're going to shoot out there, and then I'm going to shoot on home. Then this Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to open up to meet with Mr. Kuno, who will be over at it's Sun and Fun, fun. Uh, on the on the photo team yeah. there. So I'm hoping to meet him. Uh, he did get a spot for your RV. Yeah, show. I did. I did. Dude, so. he's got a nice setup. It really like you're right there at the show. Right there at the show. And right that's there that's the, show. the way to go. But yeah, so I'll be there this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So. And I will not be there Friday, but I should be there either Saturday or Sunday. So I'm looking forward to that. It's there always cool. It's always fun to shoot. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you see us, if that's the air show you're talking about or one of those, well, yeah. if you're talking about the sun and fun, yeah, come. We'll be around. We'll be around. If you see somebody with a 42 on there, like 42 on the back. That's, that's him. me. That's him. All righty. Uh, Scott Thompson. Now, now, I just want to say this. If you start your question or your comment like scott did love the show guys it's almost guaranteed yeah. it will get read on the air <laughs> and from uh derby uk there you go so any tips on finding the best way to find a project to focus and improve your skills so many different options out there i can't decide any tips yeah scott, i got one the, you know you got one so here's the thing uh, what i would say is look back through the shot that you've already taken and I'm, I imagine you're like most folks. We all shoot a little bit of everything, right? We wind up, I wind up shooting guitars and flowers and macro and just all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Go back through and, and, and if you find out somewhere in there, you're like, I'm pretty good at this. Find something in there that you love, right? Now, like I, I, I'm going to give you an example. I, I hate to push another class because we've already pushed a couple of Kelby One classes today, but... So I did a class, Scott, that uh, is, which is interesting that you're in the UK. I did a class shot on location in London about taking something you're passionate about and turning it into a photo photography project. Well, I've always found the London tube very fascinating to me. I don't know why. 
right? But I really found it very fascinating. I love writing in it. I think it's brilliant. And of course, the historical stuff in World War II and everything about it, it just makes it incredible. I mean, they have a museum for the tube, right? They have a London Underground Museum in London. And so I did a project that talked about doing that. What I would say, Scott, is find that thing that you're passionate about. It may be something that you've shot in the past and you go, hey, I kind of seem to have a knack for that. Then find something in that genre or find out you probably have a hobby, something that you really love. And it could be as easy as I really love British pubs. Why not do a whole project just about on pubs? Pubs are all they're They're a core of the community. They're all different. They all have a certain charm and they all have great people that work in pubs. You've got portraits, you've got great uh, architecture, and you've got the community around the whole. I mean, there are so many things that you could do. Just find something that you are personally passionate about and turn that into a project. And now you can also do things like uh, Joe Glida does those great things where he goes, I'm going to go out for two hours. I'm only going to shoot things that are red. Yes. And it's amazing the things that you'll come back with when you, or I'm going to go out for two hours. I'm only going to shoot shadows. My subject is going help. to be shadows. You could, you know, say I'm only going to shoot signs. I'm going to do a whole thing on signs, which can turn out to be very funny. Um, but give yourself a project like that. In fact, I, th I believe we have a isn't class it Jeff on, Leinbach. Yeah, we, have we have two class classes on, on finding projects, personal yes, projects. From Jeff Leinbach. Go watch Jeff, Jeff's, um, Classes, they're great. He's terrific. And and his classes will give you all kinds of ideas, something in there. And you wanted to add one to, to Scott. Well, I was just going to say, I would say when you're looking to that um, and trying to find a project, uh, definitely do something that you're passionate about. Um, that will fuel a lot of it. If you're doing oh, yeah. something that you're just not passionate about, you won't have that fire or that desire to do it. So do something that, you know, just sparks your interest. Yeah. Definitely. Well, that makes it easy. If it's something that you know that you yep. like. It'll, it'll propel you forward to exactly. do more. Just retouching. And then um, Timothy Force uh, is asking, just before and after totality, I had a reflection of an image of what appeared to be a couple very light clouds. Is that real or an optical illusion aberration? Uh, I was using a 10-inch Mead telescope. Um, so, Tim, without seeing it, I could not say. You're, I think you're Kelby. I'm, I'm almost positive the name I've seen you in the Kelby One community. Go into the Kelby One community, post a post with the picture, and just tag at Ecuna, and I'll look at it and see what it is. I would imagine it's not, um, it is probably clouds if that's what it's looking like, but it could just be reflections or it could be uh, uh, lens flares or I don't, I don't know. Without seeing it, it's very hard. It's very hard without seeing it. So yeah, go post it in the community because I see you in there. So um, and just do that at symbol Ikuna, and then I'll check it out. Ikuna. And then uh, Stephanie's asking a uh, question for either or both you: Which job or assignment have you been given that most gave you the feeling of I can't believe I got this lucky? Absolutely, I'll never forget it. The first time I walked out to shoot an NFL game. Yeah, I could not believe That's it. Cool. I and and I walked out to a great stadium, which was Soldier Field uh, in Chicago, uh, to shoot the the Chicago Bears. And there's a you know there's a whole underground complex that the public doesn't get to go to see, right? Back where the locker rooms are and the press and all this different stuff. And and then there's a tunnel that leads you out to the field. And it's the same tunnel that the players run out of and all. And man, walking out that tunnel, I, I took pictures of it and pictures of my buddy going out there. And I just, I walked out of that field. I just couldn't believe I was there. That was, that was the one for me, Stephanie. That was walking out that first time. I was just like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Yeah, mine's, mine's uh, driving up to NASA. You're driving uh -huh. your, your own car. You're going right up to the vehicle assembly building. You're turning right into the press site where you saw as a kid all these things happening yep. and then you're there and then you're standing right next to astronauts and you're standing 50 feet away from a rocket and you're like how did i get here and every time every time i have that same feeling of i can't believe this how did i get this lucky like what's going on so that's uh, my moments there you go yeah all right so we got prizes we got tons of prizes to give away uh so 
Uh, Marcella is winning the... Hey, hey Eric. Yeah? I think, I think I'm going to do a Photoshop tip after this. Okay. I'm, so I'm, I'm warning you and the control room. Okay. I have an idea for a Photoshop yeah, tip. Yeah, he's going to do a Photoshop tip. We're going to give away I, some I think, prizes first. I think. So we got uh, Marcella's going to give away the... Or we're giving away to Marcella the... Um, how to do that in Photoshop book. Chase L is winning the Photoshop for Digital Photographers book. Uh, Antonio D is winning the Platypod Elbow. Uh, John uh, Kiernan is winning the V Flat. Uh, Diane Allen is winning the Retouch uh, for Me. Uh, Gail Stafford uh, Duggal is winning the On One uh, No Noise 2024. And then Claudia is winning the Slick Pick. So if you won, just email us over at gridprize at kelby1.com and we'll verify your information, send you out your prize. Just please try to do that by this Friday um, so we can get it out to you. All right. I need just one second here because my computer is just doing weird stuff because that's what yeah, my computer no does. So if you let's, will just stall think, and stuff. Let's think if there's something else we could talk about. Yeah. So next week we won't be here. Just a reminder, we've got the Lightroom Conference. You can go over to kelby1 dot, or kelby1live.com, check it out. And uh, if you haven't signed up yet, make sure to sign up. And we'd love to see you there. Uh, my other class over there, which is uh, going to be all about that develop module. There's so much we can do in the develop module now where we, again, I've just got to that point where Photoshop's great, but it's really nice to be able to get, like those images you all saw from the eclipse, like nothing, everything was just done in Lightroom and I had everything done in about 45 minutes. It was, it's just crazy how quick you can get. Uh, stuff done over there. This is true. Now, unfortunately, what I'm going to show you is not that. I'm going yes. to show you, <laughs> hold on, something that is um, when you need to go to Photoshop. Yes, and Photoshop's great. <clears throat> it's awesome. Photoshop's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not small. Okay. Anybody remember that? No. Do you remember that song? No. Honeycomb's big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. It's no. not this small. One's, this it's one's a television on the... commercial. Yeah. Honeycomb. Anyway, back in black and white, right? <laughs> yeah, back in black and white. <laughs> okay. This is not a good day to pull that crap on me. It's not a bad day. All right. All right. Photoshop tip. You got a Photoshop tip? Well, I, I wouldn't really call it a tip. All right. But let me set up the tip for you, okay? <clears throat> the tip is... Oh. oh. Photoshop tip, yeah. We're, just, we're setting the mood. We're setting the mood. Let me set up the Photoshop tip for you. This tip is for people who make prints, right? And and what what okay. is this thing drives me personally absolutely insane. This that gets it, you very grumpy. This this gets me super grumpy. Okay. You go to Target or you go to Walmart or you go to Michaels or wherever you go and you buy a frame. Yes. Today in 2024, well, we're gonna talk the framing sizing. and the mat sizing is still made for traditional. Oh, I, no, no, you haven't, no, lost, no, it. You haven't lost, no, lost it. No, you haven't lost it. It's on a black screen. It's on a black screen. Hang on. Everybody's right. freaking out because his yeah. computer's on a black screen. It's They're okay. like, we lost your computer. No, no, it's okay. All right. So you go there and the frames are weird sizes. They are. And yeah, so this, this is, makes me grumpy too. Right. So you're going to wind up with yep. your, your picture not fitting correctly. Yep. And there's a Photoshop feature that... You, it, it won't always work for your picture, but when it does work, it's absolute magic, and and it's it's one of the most underused things. But I actually wind up using it quite a bit. Now I will tell you, I'm showing you it in a print scenario. It is it's it's phenomenal for social media when you need to fit into a particular uh, aspect ratio, like one by one, or yeah, uh, something for like Instagram or, or whatever. All right, so let me, let me show you what it is. All right, so here's this image. This is the image I want to use and put in a frame and all that stuff, right? And here's the frame, a stupid 11 by 14 that I want to put it into. 11 by 14, no, yeah, right. no, no. So I'm going to go over to the other image and select all and just copy, and we're going to just do a simple copy and paste. Let me copy it, switch to the other image, and I'm just going to paste it uh, into there. Now, if you if you make a selection first, right, you can paste into the selection. So I'm going to paste right into there and go, and not just choose paste, but choose paste special, and then you choose paste into, and it'll paste that photo into my selection, right? Now, it's too big, so you press Command-Zero, 
and then you can reach all the handles. And I'm going to get it scaled down. And look. Yeah. Half the boat's Not cut gonna off. Work. Nope. I'm either cutting off the buildings or the boat. Are you ready for the crazy Photoshop feature? Yes, you are. Yes. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and let me, let me just scale this down just a tad. All right. We're going to go up, up under the edit menu. And we're going to choose this miracle of AI called Content Aware Scale. Mm -hmm. You're like, what? I've never even heard of that. I know. I know. Magic. We're going to choose Content Aware Scale. It's magic. Right? It's going to bring up a thing that looks like Free Transform. But it, it actually uses AI and some incredible magic. And watch what it allows you to do. You're going to hold the Shift key. And you're going to see what the problem is. See that boat? Yep. I'm going to grab this and watch. It rebuilds the image. Look at that. Seriously. Yep. It rebuilds the image. So it still looks good. It looks right. It fits the frame. Right. So that is that is a way that you can do it. But if it doesn't work the first time, what you can do is this. Make a selection around the thing that's important to you. So the boat is the most important thing. It doesn't know what the most important thing is. Then you're going to go under the select menu and choose save selection what this does is you are telling content aware skill uh, uh, scale the important thing is this now it's it's going to be it's going to make a channel right but when you go to content aware scale now watch up top where it says protect see right there it says protect you're going to choose alpha one that's the default name of that selection you just mm -hmm. made now it knows when i move this don't move the boat. <laughs> Don't touch the boat. <laughs> Don't touch the boat. And see the little people icon next to it? That's to let you, if there's a person in the frame, you just have to choose. There's a person in here, and it'll go, oh, I'll use facial recognition. I'm sorry. Hold on. That's just stupid canvas thing. Don't, that has nothing to do with this tutorial. That just has to do with my trackpad on my laptop. Let me just reset it. Here we go. Anyway, this is a way that you can make this whole thing work for you and make it fit and still look good. And awesome. I'm amazed at how many times this actually works. It works more times than you think it would. And there is your Photoshop last tip. minute Photoshop tip of the day. Photoshop tip, yeah! <laughs> Photoshop tip, yeah! All yeah. right. Hey, if you dig stuff like this, and I know that you do, go to kelby1.com. And join. You got nothing to risk. It's got yeah. a money back guarantee. If you go in there and go, ah. Yeah. Thousand classes. Over a, a community over a like thousand. we were talking about. Incredible community. community. Incredible yeah. community. Just a bazillion classes. And it's not just the fast track. Of course, it comes with the fast track. But we And we release a brand new class every single week. What's our class this week? We don't know. Uh oh Put Christina on the spot. I put Christina on the spot. Moose. Moose is... Uh, Moose Peterson? It's a high-flying class? What's it? All right, well... Yes. So Moose has got a class coming Moose, up this week. Moose! Moose Peterson, legend of aviation mm -hmm. and wildlife photography. Got a class And landscape, Moose. all that good and stuff. And landscape. Moose coming out this week. All right, remember next week we're not here. But we're going to miss you. We care. We will see you if you're at the Lightroom Conference. You're at the Lightroom Conference. We'll see you. We'll see you, and you'll see us, and it'll yeah. be a seeing thing. All right, you got anything else to say? No. That's Shut right. up, Eric. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully I'll see some people. Up. We'll see some people at the air shows. At the air weekend. shows this weekend. weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, then, like that. That's that. That's that. And that's then the hopefully we'll is. see all you guys next week at the Lightroom Conference. Yeah, it's a conference for people who use Lightroom. Is yeah. that you? Does that sound like you? KelbyOneLive.com. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to Christina and the crew. And thanks to Dobson for taking his role today on the jib so seriously. It's moving. Look at it beautifully. It's moving. Now, this is good for him going up. Oh, this is, it's starting to, it's ooh. tracking a little off. The, it's, it's good. It's He's not, holding it's it. It's not terrible. Yeah. Hold it. Yeah. Work it. Yeah. It's not bad. Oh, it's, it's, it's sliding. There That's we go. pretty good. It's not bad though. That's, that's I have one high of the hopes for him. I have high hopes. Yep.